So, clip shows. Not exactly the most lauded kind of episode for a beloved TV show, considering that most of the time its plot is literally just a loose framework that provides a flimsy excuse to show bits and pieces of previous episodes, but I do get that there's a totally legitimate reason for making them. Most of those reasons usually revolving around the lack of a budget for new material. However, I think one such episode that really handles the idea of a glorified recap show very well is Book 3, Chapter 17 of Avatar The Last Airbender, The Ember Island Players. Taking place at a local theater on Ember Island, the show takes the idea of a traditional clip show episode and kind of turns it on its head, acting as both a recap of the show's overarching plot before the endgame kicks into full gear, and as a fun little bit of self-parody and introspection. Grab your bag full of meat sticks and take a seat in the nosebleeds as I talk about why the Ember Island Players is probably my favorite take on the concept of a clip show episode that I've personally ever seen. And just to be safe, especially because this episode does talk about stuff over the course of the entire series, big time heckin' spoilers ahead. Lack subtlety. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. So the episode starts with Aang and Zuko practicing firebending when Sokka and Suki enter the scene and tell the gang that there's somehow an entire play written about them and their adventures entitled The Boy in the Iceberg. The playwright, Pooh on Tim, named for one of the show's writers, Tim Hedrick, is noted as gathering various third-party accounts about Team Avatar from throughout the series, citing the likes of the pirates from Book 1, the singing nomads from Book 2, and the poor unfortunate cabbage merchant that had gotten caught in the crossfire of Team Avatar shenanigans multiple times. Sokka decides that he wants to go see it because it'd be the sort of time-wasting nonsense he'd been missing, and... Yeah, that's kind of a fair point, considering how much more serious things had gotten as the show moved further along in Book 3. I mean, this episode is literally sandwiched between Katara seeking revenge on the man who murdered her mother, and the start of the four-part finale where Team Avatar has to defeat Fire Lord Ozai, before he uses Sozin's Comet to repeat the genocide of the Air Nomads with the Earth Kingdom, so... All things considered, I'm totally down for some lighthearted filler, actually. And besides, as a drama club kid myself, I love when TV shows dip into the world of live theater, so seeing this episode for the first time back in 2008 was doubly great for me. Anyway, Team Avatar take their seats and the opening curtain rises, and we get our first taste of the Ember Island player's interpretation of Sokka, Katara, and Aang, but it's safe to say that they, uh took some creative liberties. We constantly roam these icy South Pole seas, and yet never do we find anything fulfilling. All I want is a full feeling in my stomach. I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the Avatar, silly, here to spread joy and fun. <laughs> Did I mention that I'm an incurable prankster? So yeah, Sokka's a dim-witted goofball, Katara's a soppy, melodramatic mess, and Aang is this goofy, whimsical dweeb who, to the real Aang's dismay, is played by a woman. Fun facts though, not only was Emmer Island Aang being played by a woman, and not to the traditional casting choice of plays like Peter Pan, where typically the title role is played by a woman, but according to the commentary track on the Complete Series Blu-ray set, it was also a send-up to the pressure that the showrunners felt to cast a woman to voice Aang instead of Zack Tyler. Tyler Eisen, which is actually a fairly common practice for young male characters in animation. Anyway, the first act comes to a close after a recap of the Siege of the North, and most of Team Avatar expresses their extreme displeasure with how they're portrayed, but Toph seems to be the only one who's actually enjoying the show, which isn't really surprising considering how many other times in the series she's mercilessly roasted people. The boulder's over his conflicted feelings, and now he's ready to bury you in a rock -a -lanch. Whenever you're ready, the pebble. I'm just saying, this isn't something we should make a habit of doing. Why? Because it's fun, and you hate fun? Three on three. Actually, Toph, there's four of us. I didn't count you. You know, no bending and all. I can still fight! Three on three plus Sokka. <laughs> And hell, even when the second act starts and it's time to meet Ember Island Toph, 
who compensates for being blind by using sound waves generated by screaming at people. Toph is somehow even more into the play, though that probably has something to do with the fact that she arguably has the best and coolest portrayal out of everyone in Team Avatar. I mean, hey, if someone made a play about my life and wrote me as this super badass baby face who took down 10 bad guys at once and had sassy remarks, yeah, I'd probably give it a glowingly positive review too. Calm down, diddly 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 diddly. They did their best, shoddly iddly iddly diddly. Gotta be nice, hostility diddly diddly diddly. Oh, hell, diddly ding dong crap! Now, before we go any further, I think we need to talk about a little thing called flanderization. Idly ho, neighborinos! Flanderization is when a character in a fictional work has one of their character traits exaggerated more and more, to an almost absurd degree, until that one trait basically becomes all that character even is anymore, essentially robbing them of any semblance of layers or dimensionality. The name comes from Ned Flanders from the TV show The Simpsons, who started out as a friendly, generous, religious man who was a model husband, father, and neighbor, making him a great character contrast to the series' pro tag, Homer Simpson. But as the show went on, he was written to be more and more driven solely by his Christian beliefs until he basically just became a stereotypical Bible thumping Christian evangelist. This sort of thing has happened in a lot of media Fairly Odd Parents, SpongeBob SquarePants, Metroid Other M, and Resident Evil, just to name a few. But it's handled in a really interesting way here in Avatar because Avatar never ran long enough for its characters to succumb to flanderization like those in other franchises often would. It had a definitive story start, middle, and end, and the characters maintain their layers and their complexity, developing into fascinating three-dimensional people whose journeys were a joy to experience instead of a groan-inducing chore. So to take these beloved characters and hypothetically flanderize them like this in the form of a low-quality community theater production that's being watched by the actual people whose lives are being portrayed on stage is actually really fascinating, because it allows for the characters within the universe itself to have to confront how they would be seen by others at face value, and it allows for us, the viewers, to get this funny and kind of surreal insight into what these characters could have become if the show had overstayed its welcome. Katara being this long-winded, overdramatic preacher about the power of hope, Sokka telling bad jokes and obsessing over food, Aang being an overly whimsical and sickeningly upbeat prankster, Iroh being a lazy glutton, Toph being this impossibly rough and tough wrestler like badass, weirdly not that far removed from the kind of dude she used to beat up for a living, and Zuko being this brooding, angry, short-tempered, obsessive jerk who disregarded his uncle and wouldn't shut up about his honor. So you remember how in my video about the Great Divide, one of my biggest complaints was how both tribe leaders were really just obviously one-dimensional cardboard cutouts whose entire characters began and ended with a single trait? Yeah, now imagine that for the entire cast. This is where I think the Ember Island Players really excels as a clip show episode, because by taking these possible flanderizations of these characters we've come to love and playing them up for laughs, while having the actual characters react to them in real time, not only do we get a nice piece of self-parody, with the play often poking fun at certain things like Jet's kind of unclear death or everyone's desire to just kind of skip over the Great Divide, but we also get this really interesting glimpse into what these characters could have been, which is entertaining to see, to be sure, but, you know, from a distance. A very, very self-contained distance. I'm gonna see my lawyer. Why? I'm gonna find out if you can sue a show for breach of taste. <laughs> Interspersed in between every act of the play are intermission scenes where the real Team Avatar talk about how they're being portrayed, with most everyone outside of Toph, and occasionally Suki, probably wishing they had Tom Cruise and the Mummy levels of creative control so they didn't look like such dorks. These scenes are actually pretty crucial to the episode's quality too, not only to give the viewers a breather between the comedy of the play itself, but also because seeing these warped portrayals of themselves on stage allows for the real Team Avatar to come to terms with certain things about themselves and the things that they'd said and done throughout the show. The one person who I think takes all of this the hardest had to be Zuko, though. Like he tells Toph, seeing the Ember Island player's version of himself just act like a heartless jerkass and viciously insult and betray his uncle just serves to remind him of his actual betrayal of Uncle Iroh in Ba Sing Se, something that, 
like I've talked about before in that Zuko video, was actually a pretty crucial turning point for him as a person. Iroh was the one person in Zuko's life who loved and cared for him unconditionally, who was always there for him with a cup of tea and a word of advice, and Zuko stabbing him in the back just for one more shot at chasing the dragon of his honor? is something that Zuko regards as his greatest regret. So honestly, I don't blame him for being so sour about his portrayal in the play. I mean, seeing someone just take all of your mistakes and your bad choices and throw them back in your face for the amusement of total strangers just... It just hurts, man. Toph does manage to cheer Zuko up a bit by telling him about a chance encounter she had with Iroh back in Book 2, Chapter 8, The Chase, where Iroh would talk about how he just wanted Zuko to see the light and find his way in the world, and she assures Zuko that, by helping the Avatar end his father's war, Zuko had done just that. Aang, on the other hand, is borderline inconsolable, having stormed out during the scene with the Zutara ship tease, and telling Katara that he wasn't sure where they were, like, relationship-wise, since they kissed before the invasion on the day of Black Sun, but nothing really seemed to come of that ever since. And after Katara expresses that she's kind of confused right now, and reminds Aang that, oh yeah, they're still in the middle of a war, Aang kisses Katara without her consent, which just... No! No! Bad Avatar! Bad! Do not do this! Do not do this ever! Like, ever! Just do not! Fair play to the writers for portraying this as a bad move on Aang's part and having him instantly chastise himself for doing it, but seriously, even if you have romantic feelings for someone, do not do this! So this is how Liberty dies. With thunderous applause. Yeah, so clearly this play is a cheesy, overdramatic, corny, goofy mess that takes a ton of creative liberties with the truth and turns all the protags into flanderized versions of themselves, but... What about the villains? Well, actually, they come off way better than the heroes in this play because... Well, I mean it is a Fire Nation production, and Lord knows you don't want to disrespect Fire Lord Ozai with a disrespectful portrayal of him in his own country. Hell, we're talking about a guy who burned and banished his own son, the Crown Prince, by the way, for speaking out of turn during a meeting. So imagine what he'd do to some no-name community theater actor who tries to put himself over by mocking the world-conquering Fire Lord. He'd probably burn the whole theater to the ground or make the Ember Island players do a production of Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. Not sure which of those two would be worst, honestly. No, but really though, is it any surprise that the likes of Azula and Ozai are portrayed as smart, calculating, brilliant characters in this play, considering that this play is a production of a Fire Nation theater troupe in front of a Fire Nation audience, written by a guy from... Well, okay, apparently he's from the Earth Kingdom, but at this point, it's just as likely that he's from somewhere under Fire Nation occupation. One major aspect of how the Fire Nation sought to permanently tighten its grip on the world as the Hundred Year War went on, outside of the actual war stuff, was how they portrayed themselves to their citizens back home. They weren't bloodthirsty monsters destroying everything in their path, like how many in the Earth Kingdom and Water Tribe saw them. No, 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 they were benevolent, heroic harbingers of worldwide prosperity and cultural harmony which you know is a real fancy way to dress up a century-long war that literally started with a genocide look nationalist wartime propaganda in the fire nation was nothing new and this play wasn't even the first example we saw in the show as far back as book one in the episode the deserter ang Sokka, and katara visit the local fire days festival where they stumble upon a children's puppet show that blatantly portrays fire lord ozai as this heroic guardian of the people, keeping the Fire Nation safe from those evil, no-good earthbenders. And when Aang goes undercover at a Fire Nation school in the Book 3 episode The Headband, he finds out that the Fire Nation's kids are literally being taught revisionist history, with the kids learning about the Fire Nation's defeat of the so-called Air Nation Army, despite Aang kind of knowing for a fact that the Air Nomads didn't have a formal military, and that Sozin defeated them by ambush. Surely this is the sort of thing that Fire Lord Sozin had in mind when he first told Avatar Roku about his idea for expanding his empire, when he referred to it as sharing the Fire Nation's prosperity with the rest of the world. 
And it's that twisted, distorted mindset about what the war actually was that's carried onward in these examples of propaganda to make it seem like not only was the war a good thing, but that the Fire Nation was right for engaging in imperialism and genocide. After all, what better way to truly destroy people than to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history? All of this is to say that it really shouldn't come as any surprise then that, during the third act of the Boy in the Iceberg play, when Azula kills Zuko in their duel and Ozai kills Aang, securing his victory in the war, the people in the crowd cheer wildly for it. They don't see manipulative, power-hungry warmongers tightening their white knuckle grip over innocent people's lives. They see their conquering heroes defeating a traitorous prince and a goofy interloper who stood in the way of the Fire Nation's global prosperity. Seriously, the dude kills the Avatar and he gets a bigger pop than CM Punk in Chicago. This moment serves as a stark reminder to the protagonists of what's actually at stake here. If Ozai and Azula win, then the Fire Nation wins. And if this sort of cultural propaganda remains unopposed, with no one to break the Fire Nation's ironclad control of the world, or to stop their onslaught of revisionist history, then the Fire Nation is simply gonna win forever. And the people will applaud them for it. This episode is so good at what it does. It's a great mix of comedy, character development, self-parody, and self-awareness, all while serving as an effective recap of the story so far, as well as a reminder of what's to come. Although I don't really think Team Avatar has quite the same glowing praise for the play as I did for the episode it was featured in. That wasn't a good play. I'll say. No kidding. Horrible. You said it. But the effects were decent. Wow, were they reviewing The Boy in the Iceberg or my mediocre YouTube channel? <laughs> So, what did you think? Did you like how the Ember Island players handled the idea of a recap episode, or did you think that the over-the-top goofy acting was a bit much? Let me know in the comments below. Give this video a like if you liked it, subscribe for more stuff like this in the future, share this video on your favorite social medias, and ring the bell so you'll always get notified when I upload. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video, friendos.